Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and insert extraneous material on the resolution under consideration. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentlewoman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of my resolution, HRES 995, which expresses this House's commitment to providing the full, on-time funding our men and women in uniform need to defend our nation. This week and next, Mr. Speaker, we'll be spending time on this floor discussing the devastating impacts nine consecutive continuing resolutions have had on our military's readiness and on our ability to deter and defend against our adversaries. Despite the fact that this House has consistently and normally in a bipartisan fashion completed our work on time, we have repeatedly seen partisan politics, particularly in the Senate, prevent the Congress from delivering a funding bill to the President's desk on time. In fact, since Republicans took control of the House in 2011, the House has never failed to pass a defense appropriations bill on time. Just a few weeks ago, we passed H.R. 6157, the Department of Defense Appropriations Act for fiscal year 19, with an overwhelmingly bipartisan 359 to 49 vote. Today's resolution, Mr. Speaker, expresses the sense of this House that failing to provide full, on-time, stable funding increases the risk to our service members and aids our adversaries. The resolution expresses our commitment to ending the funding uncertainty our military faces and urges the Senate to similarly complete its work so we can provide the on-time funding our armed services require. Mr. Speaker, we must stop forcing our men and women in uniform and their families to pay the price for our dysfunction. Today, Mr. Speaker, we'll consider three resolutions. HRES 995, which I have introduced, acknowledges the unprecedented global threat environment we face and the negative impact these continuing resolutions have had on our military's ability to confront this environment and deter and, if necessary, defeat our enemies. We will also consider HRES 994, offered by my colleague and fellow member of the Armed Services Committee, Mr. Gallagher from Wisconsin. Mr. Gallagher is a Marine with two deployments to the Al Anbar province in Iraq. His resolution details the negative impacts of CRs and funding instability on the readiness of the Marine Corps. And finally, Mr. Speaker, we'll consider HRES 998, offered by Mr. Whitman of Virginia, the chairman of the Sea Power and Projection Forces Subcommittee on the House Armed Services Committee. Mr. Whitman's resolution lays out the damage that the CRs and the unpredictable funding has done to the United States Navy. Next week, Mr. Speaker, we'll consider resolutions addressing the impact of unstable funding on the United States Air Force and the United States Army. We know, Mr. Speaker, that not every member of this body is on one of the defense-related committees, but we also know that every member of this body is committed to the security of our nation. And I take the opportunity today, along with my colleagues, to lay out in detail the threats we face the impacts that our actions in this House can have on our military's ability to keep us safe. Reflecting on the challenges facing our armed forces, Secretary Mattis put it this way, as hard as the last 16 years have been on our military, no enemy in the field has done more to harm the readiness of the U.S. military than the combined impact of the Budget Control Act's defense spending cuts worsened by us operating nine out of the last 10 years under continuing resolutions. Secretary Mattis went on to explain the consequences of Congress's failure to provide reliable, on-time, sufficient funding. Quote, ships will not receive the required maintenance to put to sea. The ships already at sea will be extended outside of port. Aircraft will remain on the ground their pilots not at the sharpest edge, and eventually ammunition, training, and manpower will not be sufficient to deter war." End quote. Not sufficient to deter war, Mr. Speaker.
No experience, Mr. Speaker, has had a greater impact on me during my time as a member of this body than having the Secretary of Defense testify in front of us as members of the Armed Services Committee and say that congressional abrogation of our constitutional duty to fund our military is putting our service members at risk. While our military has suffered under this burden of continuing resolutions and the dangerous policies of the previous administration, our adversaries have been making steady gains. Never before in recent history have we seen the gap between our capabilities and those of our adversaries widen at such a breathtaking pace and not in our favor, Mr. Speaker. China is pursuing an aggressive strategy to overtake our military and our economic advantage globally. They're developing technologies that are specifically targeted to diminish our ability to project our force. They're developing weapon systems against which we may not be able to defend. They have utilized deficiencies in our current CFIUS process to attempt to acquire critical U.S. technology. Chinese companies like Huawei and ZTE have made significant efforts to embed themselves in the United States, putting our te telecommunications networks and potentially our defense supply chain at risk. Militarily, economically, in cyberspace, in space, on land, air, and sea, the Chinese have made clear their objective is to achieve global preeminence which means they must attempt to displace us. The Russians continue to modernize their nuclear arsenal as they violate their commitments to us under the INF Treaty. They, too, are developing advanced and threatening weapon systems and attempting to exercise their hegemonic ambitions across Europe. They have violated the borders and sovereignty of their neighbors. In the words of the National Defense Strategy, they're making efforts, quote, to shatter the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and use emerging technologies to discredit and subvert democratic processes in Georgia, Crimea, and Eastern Ukraine. They have attempted to subvert our own democratic processes, as we saw in last week's indictment of 12 members of the GRU, Russian military intelligence. We have seen in Russia and China a return to great power competition and eight years of Obama-era policies facilitated these developments. At the same time, we continue to face significant threats from rogue regimes like Iran and North Korea. The Iranians benefited tremendously from the payments they received from the Obama administration, over $1.5 billion when they entered into the Obama nuclear deal. This deal paved the way for a nuclear-armed Iran with no real verification provisions, no complete disclosure of their past activity, no cessation of their enrichment activity, and it lifted restrictions on their ballistic missile program. President Trump was right to withdraw from this disastrous deal, but we are still living with the consequences of an emboldened Iran enriched with U.S. taxpayer dollars and a pathway to a nuclear weapon. Their support for terrorist groups like Hamas and Hezbollah has grown, while they continue to pose an existential threat to the state of Israel. The North Koreans similarly continue to pose a serious threat, Mr. Speaker, with an arsenal of nuclear weapons, an ongoing ballistic missile program, and continued pursuit of biological and chemical weapons. Despite recent success on the battlefield against ISIS, Radical Islamic terrorism continues to pose a threat to our nation. We've got troops deployed today, Mr. Speaker, around the globe in the fight against terrorism. And as we face all of these threats, we are also living through an era of increasingly rapid technological development. The very nature of warfare is changing. The ability and the agility required to successfully respond to these threats requires funding sufficiency and certainty. Mr. Speaker, that certainty simply cannot be provided through continuous, continuing resolutions. In the face of all these threats, Mr. Speaker, we in this body must resolve not 
to add to the risk our troops are facing. We must resolve to fulfill our constitutional duty, provide sufficient, on-time, reliable funding. It took many years for the readiness, manpower, and training crises we face to develop. We in this House and in the Senate must be part of the solution today and for many days and years into the future. In closing, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to read to you something that the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral John Richardson, said before the House Armed Services Committee last year in a hearing about the damage of continuing resolutions. I have a hard time believing, he said, that I am sitting before you now to discuss the potential that we might take steps to make our sailors' mission more difficult, to give our adversaries more advantage." End quote. Think about that, Mr. Speaker. That's what this debate is about. That's what this resolution is about. Insufficient, unreliable funding gives our adversaries an advantage. We must not be part of that any longer. We must resolve to get our work done on time in the House and the Senate and to fulfill our constitutional obligation. We must, in this Congress, Mr. Speaker, be worthy of the sacrifices our men and women in uniform make for us every day. Mr. Speaker, I urge the adoption of this resolution, and I reserve the balance of my time.